Welcome to the Young Turks. Great week ahead for you guys. Great show ahead today. Although, of course, as always, we have bad news. Stock market spiraling out of control downward. Uh, Tim Geithner is staying <laughs> to add to the disaster. Funny pictures of Michelle Bachman. Well, that's fun. Um, but I do have a unique take on that. Uh, what else is happening? Rick Perry's getting in the race. We're going to show you what a dummy he is. Yeah, you heard me right. Don't make me say it again. Uh, and then um, we've got unfortunate news out of London. We've got unfortunate news out of Afghanistan. And the list goes on and on. So let's get started. First, uh, we have a bit of a disaster on Wall Street. Uh, 699 points uh, was how much the Dow went down uh, last week. Well, it has now fallen below 11,000. It closed on a low on Monday, and it got pounded throughout the day. Now, here's the critical uh, point you have to understand. Most of the political reporting throughout today has said that it is uh, partly due to the S&P downgrading our credit rating. That is not at all true. Our credit rating is related to treasury bonds. So if we uh, have our credit rating lowered, it might actually cost us more money to borrow, which would be terrible for our deficit. But that is not what's happened. In fact, the reverse has happened. Treasuries fell from 2.57% to 2.33% in terms of the rate that we have to pay, meaning that the downgrading did not affect us at all. It went in the other direction. That is not why the stock market fell, even though you couldn't tell that if you watched President Obama or any of the Republicans reacting to what happened in the stock market today. No, the stock market fell for two different reasons. Number one, uh, Europe is in a state of disaster. Uh, the European Central Bank came in and said, hey, you know what? Not only are we shoring up Greece, which we've already done, but now we are going to go ahead and shore up other countries, including Italy and Spain. But what wound up happening is that the markets reacted to that, saying, hey, you know what? If that's what's happening, then we're downgrading France and Germany, because they might not be able to pay the bills for Italy, Spain, and Greece. So that really shook the confidence of a lot of people in the stock market. The second reason, which is huge, is about the global economy, but also specifically about the U.S. economy. Investors have lost confidence that there is enough people to buy stuff, okay? In the U.S., 70% of our GDP is consumer spending. The problem is consumers can't spend if they don't have any money. And that is the number one problem we're running into. For example, in April through June, that's the second quarter of this year, we grew at an anemic 1.3%. If you thought if you thought that was bad in the first quarter, we only grew at 0.4%. And all those numbers have now been revised down. The first half of 2011 in its entirety has been the slowest since the recession began, or since we got past the recession, when of course we were in negative growth. So the real problem is the fundamentals of the economy. There aren't enough people to buy the products that people are making. So when you hear the politicians or the political reporters talking about, oh, you know, we had this debt ceiling problem, we have this political impasse, it led to our credit rate rating getting downgraded, and it led to the stock market going down, that is completely and utterly wrong. No, that is a different problem. The problem we have here is that we have massive unemployment and we have an anemic growth in our economy. And by the way, that did not get addressed at all in the debt ceiling. In fact, if anything, investors are reacting to this grand plan that wound up doing nothing but hurting the employment situation. There have been estimates that because of this deal that uh, Republicans and Democrats struck, we might lose another 1.8 million jobs. And then who would buy the stuff that these businesses produce? The only reason why corporate profits aren't in disastrous shape right now is because they're selling so much abroad and they're producing so much abroad, hence they don't need the U.S. economy for jobs at least. Okay, so. Uh, our fundamentals are what's uh, the problem here. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Now, speaking of people telling you otherwise, let's go to the both sides. So President Obama comes out this morning as the economy is tanking, and he's going to give a speech about how America rocks. And if we could only compromise more, everything would be fantastic. So let's go to the first part of that. I realize that after what we just went through, there's some skepticism that Republicans and Democrats on the so-called super committee, this joint committee that's been set up, 
we'll be able to reach a compromise. But my hope is that Friday's news will give us a renewed sense of urgency. Markets will rise and fall, but this is the United States of America. No matter what some agency may say, we've always been and always will be a AAA country. Yeah, I'm tired of the goofiness, man. I, we're number one, we're number one, we'll always be AAA in our own minds. Yeah, I know, in our own minds. But the question is, what does the rest of the world think of us, et cetera? And now, am I saying that the S&P got it right? No, I'm not saying that, right? But first of all, as the stock market is plummeting, to come out and give this speech that misunderstands the problem is, uh, is a big problem. Number two, the answer is two things. What did he say? Compromise, always compromise. The compromise is what gave you this disastrous deal that people are reacting poorly to for all the other reasons that you don't realize. You think it's because you didn't cut spending enough. Actually, it's because you cut spending too much and nobody's got any money to buy anything, right? And then the second part is, of course, the, oh, we're always AAA. I don't care what uh, facts are. Look, that's a Republican kind of uh, talk. There's no need for that. But of course, the real underlying problem of, the, of this, his inability to understand the problem is what he gets to again in the second clip. What sets us apart is that we've always not just had the capacity, but also the will to act, the determination to shape our future, the willingness in our democracy to work out our differences in a sensible way, and to move forward, not just for this generation, but for the next generation. And we're going to need to summon that spirit today. We're going to need to summon the spirit of compromise, etc. In other words, don't worry, I'm going to make that same exact mistake again. When the Republicans come and ask for more spending cuts, I'm going to say, well, I guess the markets reacted poorly. I'll give them more spending cuts, which is totally wrong. By the way, one of the major reasons that S&P stated for the downgrade was the inability of the government, it appears, to move on taxes at all. They said in several different parts of the report, if we were confident that the Bush tax cuts were going to get taken away in 2013 as they are set to expire now, we would not be doing this. But they now think, because the Republicans are so insistent, that those tax cuts have to remain permanent. And the Democrats appear to have no willingness to actually fight against the Republicans, that they're afraid, well, you're not going to have enough revenue. So if you're going to do another round of tax cuts and you don't have enough revenue, well, how are you going to balance your budget? And you can't. You can't balance your budget when you are at record low tax rates. We're at about 14% of GDP right now. Our historical average in America is 18%. If we just got back to our historical average, and I told you about this before, the markets, uh, so Bloomberg wrote a great article about how the markets are not moving on the treasury bonds because they think, oh, come on, you're at such a record low tax rate. All you got to do is raise taxes a little bit, and obviously your credit rating will be fine. But now they recognize, oh my God, these guys are lunatics. Even at a record low tax rate, they refuse to raise taxes under any circumstances. The system is fundamentally broken. Is that the lesson that President Obama seemed to have gotten there? I didn't hear that lesson at all. I heard the exact opposite. Now, you think the Republicans are going to ease up on uh, President Obama given what's happened here? <laughs> all right, so first of all, gee, I wonder who John McCain is going to blame for us getting downgraded by S&P. Well, uh, let's go to uh, clip number 10 here and try to find out. Well, I agree that there is dysfunction in our system, and a lot of it has to do with the failure of the President of the United States to lead. I would remind you that Republicans control one-third of the government. The, the Senate and the presidency are controlled by the Democrats. And Well, look, it's got to be the Democrats because they control two-thirds. You see the trick being played there? They get the Democrats to do exactly what they want, which is all spending cuts and no revenue increases whatsoever. Then they turn around and say, well, what's the Democrats running the government? If there's any problem at all, it must have been the Democrats' fault. Did we not tell you they were going to do that? How could we know that and the President of the United States and the entire White House, in their political genius, doesn't know that that's the trick that the Republicans are going to do? That the minute you agree with them, they're going to blame you for agreeing with them. But you know what? If you keep listening to John McCain in that interview on Sunday, he's going to tell you who's really at fault. Now look, we could have <coughs> reached an agreement a lot earlier. But the members of the House of Representatives uh, had a mandate, had a mandate last November, and it was jobs in the economy and it was spending. And for them to then agree to tax increases and spending increases was obviously a repudiation 
of uh, the mandate that they felt they had from right. last November. But Senator, you and talked again, about the, the you, president has not led. The president has not led. That's his fault. But in between, the president hasn't led, and it's all his fault. What did he say? He said, "Well, the House of Representatives thought they had a mandate that they were never going to compromise." So the reality is, of course, it's because the Republicans in the House did not compromise. Even McCain knows that, but it doesn't matter. He messages the. Uh, around it and makes a sandwich of blame for Obama and says, here, eat this, as Cleaver would say, Satan sandwich. I'd say it in a different way. And we turn to the candidates, the Republican candidates. John Huntsman says that President Obama has presided over the first downgrade of the United States credit rating in our history. So it's not that the Republicans caused it. Uh, it's not that it was their intransigence. It was that the president presided over it. Sad day, you're the president, you get 100% of the blame. Now let's go to Mitt Romney, and I love these two quotes. Number one, he says, the failure of the president to reignite this economy and get people back to work is one of the reasons we're seeing such high levels of deficit and why the debt continues to grow at such an alarming rate. So, what happened? The Republicans just got Obama to sign on to a deal where we would lose jobs rather than gain jobs. And then they immediately turn around and the leading Republican candidate says, you look at this, Obama's not creating enough jobs, it's his fault. That's why we can't get out of this debt because Obama won't create any jobs. Well, he can't create any jobs because he just agreed with you guys to do spending cuts that is gonna cost us 1.8 million jobs. So whose fault is it? It's Obama's fault for ever agreeing with these guys. We told you they were gonna flip it around and say it was all his fault the minute the deal was over. That's exactly what's happened. Romney's second quote. We need to put more Americans back to work and I'm afraid the president is just out of his depth when it comes to understanding how the private economy works. <laughs> so, there they are, rubbing it in his face a little bit more. You dumbass, you agreed with us to cut spending. Apparently, you don't know how this thing works. When you cut spending, you lose jobs. You don't add jobs, idiot. It's all your fault for presiding over job losses. We still got a deficit. We're still blaming you for it and for getting downgraded. And we'll throw in the market's tumbling, which is what Mitt Romney was talking about today when he talked about those quotes, even though the market crashing uh, has absolutely nothing to do with the downgrade. It doesn't matter, you roll it all up into one big ball of ugliness and you go, who's presiding over it? Who's the president? Obama, it's all his fault. Agree with the Republicans at your peril. When are you ever gonna learn that you're never gonna catch a break by agreeing with them? All they're gonna do is spit in your eye and blame you for all the problems that they caused if you agree with their principles. But apparently the president is never going to learn that lesson. Never. Okay. But you know what? Don't worry. Next round, we will have more agreement with the Republicans. You, you, you can bet your bottom dollar on it. Here, I, I'm going to go further here because I think this is a great explainer as to what's going on with the S&P and, uh, and also what's going on with the candidates, okay, and the two different sides. So. On the one hand, we've got the Republicans blaming President Obama for everything. On the other hand, what's the president going to respond with when it comes to uh, us getting downgraded by S&P? First, Michelle Bachman says, quote, It happened on your watch, Mr. President. You were AWOL. You were missing in action. Well, there you have it. 100% Obama's fault. Doesn't matter that the S&P said, hey, part of the problem here is that we won't raise taxes, and that doesn't make sense. You can't balance the budget without it. It doesn't matter that they say uh, a huge part of the problem is the intransigence of the parties in coming to a deal. Who's intransigent? Clearly the House Republicans were, even John McCain admitted that, but it doesn't matter. It's all your fault. Now, the interesting part is how does the White House respond? Jay Carney, White House Press Secretary, responds by saying, quote, we must do better to make clear our nation's will, capacity, and commitment to work together to tackle our major fiscal and economic challenges. In other words, no, 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 no. I know they're blaming all us 100%. We won't blame them at all. No, what we'll say is it's all of our faults. The problem is we're not working together enough. We didn't compromise with the Republicans enough because we're not working together enough. Really, that's your strategy. What a dumb strategy. The other guy blames you and you say, oh, well, it's kind of both of our faults. Who would, if you're looking at that and you're not a political 
expert, and you look at that from an outsider's perspective, you go, I don't know, one guy's saying it's totally that guy's fault, another guy kind of agrees and says, well, it's all of our faults. If you don't know anything about that controversy, what would you think? You think, well, it's probably the guy's fault who's saying, yeah, it's all of our faults, right? God, how bad are you at messaging? They're unbelievable. They're gonna get routed in this election if they continue this way. It's almost too late to turn it around. All right, now let's look at uh, how this uh, stuff came about, right? So New York Times is explaining in this article uh, what happened with the ratings agencies and why we got downgraded. And I think it's really fascinating. Quote, the ratings agency's actions puts additional pressure on the still-to-be-named Congressional Committee to find additional spending cuts, tax increases, or both to bring down the inexorably rising national debt. You see what's happening here, the game that's being played? Look, Wall Street has already decided, and they have already told Washington. Part of the problem is that the Tea Party is not getting the message. It's a really mixed and fascinating situation where the Tea Party is to the right of Wall Street, but they're actually causing Wall Street problems. So I like that they're causing Wall Street problems. I don't like that they're to the right of them. It's a fascinating phenomenon, but here, here's why. The deal is already set, as I've told you countless times. It's the grand bargain. They're like, look, everybody else agrees. The corporate Democrats and the corporate Republicans agree. Here's what we do. We cut spending to the bone. We cut entitlements. And we cut taxes for the rich and for corporations. And we so-called raise taxes on loopholes, subsidies, and exemptions, which means things like your home mortgage deduction go away, and most of those tax increases fall on the middle class. Wall Street has already agreed to that, and they're already uh, pressuring Washington. But apparently, Washington didn't get the message clearly enough, so S&P says, hey, you know what? Let's send the message a little bit more clearly. If you do this grand bargain, you can have your prize AAA rating back. If not, I don't know. You know, I'm seeing intransigence. That's why in the S&P report, they are partly blaming the Republicans, because what they're doing is they're blaming the Tea Party, saying, you idiots, we already gave you your marching orders. Go get that deal. It gives the rich huge advantages, and the thing is, if the Tea Party was on the other side of it, I'd say, okay, fantastic. The Tea Party being in their infinite stupidity are like, no, we want to give the rich more, and we want to hurt the middle class more. <laughs> that is unbelievable. And so now here's another quote from the New York Times that gives you an insight. Mary J. Miller, Assistant Secretary of Financial Markets, that is a person who uh, met with uh, the banking officials, as you're about to see, for, on behalf of the government. She represents us at the Treasury. Just, here's a quote from the New York Times. Just the day before, Ms. Miller and her team met at the Hay Adams Hotel with a group of senior Wall Street executives who advised the Treasury on its borrowing. None of the members believed that the government's credit rating would be lowered in the near term. I get two things out of that quote. That's why you gotta dive into the middle of these stories to see what's actually going on. One is, you see how who gives the marching orders? The Treasury Department goes to a department, goes to a hotel in Washington, where, where they meet with Wall Street executives, and the Wall Street executives tell them, hey, here's what you must do, okay? Hey, we're your boss, and we're telling you, you're gonna do this plan, and then we'll be okay on your credit rating, okay? And then, because why does the Treasury Department, the government care so much about the credit rating? Because if the credit rating actually affects Treasury bonds, that means, the, our borrowing costs will go up tremendously. That means our deficit will go up tremendously. So after Wall Street puts us in this bind where they screwed over the economy royally, then they come and hold us hostage and say, hey, if you don't do exactly what we tell you to do, we're gonna explode your deficit. So Treasury and the Wall Street get a deal at the Hay Adams Hotel, as the New York Times is alluding to. They walk out and Treasury thinks everything's gonna be fine and S&P screws them anyway. Now, look, S&B can be you know, a lone wolf. Maybe they're acting outside of what the rest of Wall Street wants. Maybe they genuinely think that the, our credit rating is in trouble, and I actually wouldn't even blame them for that. It's also possible they think, hey, you know what? Let's twist these arms a little bit more to make sure we get that grand bargain where we win completely and the middle class gets crushed. And look, the reason that I say that, and some people say, oh, come on, S&P is independent. I need you to wakey, wakey, wake up, okay? That's not how the real world works. And, and it's not a conspiracy. Let me tell you wh exactly what I'm talking about. The S&P is a rating agency that gets paid not by the investors. That would make sense. Because remember, they're rating different things like stocks, bonds, 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those securities that get us, home mortgage securities that get us in so much trouble. Now, if you're an investor and you're looking to their rating to see what you should buy, well, then it makes sense that you pay them so that they're on your side. But that's not how the system works. The system works by Wall Street paying the rating agencies to rate their products, which means that, of course, the ratings are going to be junk. They're going to be nonsense, because they're going to say, what would you, you're paying me to give you a good rating? Great, you got a good rating. If they give them bad ratings, they don't pay them anymore. So these rating agencies are no longer independent. Moody's, Fitch, S&P, all these guys, they're controlled by the people who sign their paychecks, which is Wall Street. So S&P is not likely to be acting alone. It's possible since Moody and Fitch didn't move. But there's an excellent chance that some people on Wall Street told S&P, you want to keep getting contracts with us, you want to keep getting your paid your fat bonus, your commissions and your salaries, well, you do what we tell you to do to pressure the U.S. government to give us every imaginable break. And let me give, give you one more example so you get a sense of what's on the line here. One of the things on the line is a corporate tax holiday that would lower taxes for corporations that have money abroad from 35%, which is the rate they're supposed to pay, down to 5%. That would save them hundreds of billions of dollars. You think they don't care about that? <laughs> They're obsessed with that. While you're not paying any attention to it, they, they got to make sure that's in the grand bargain, OK? And they can't get that tax cut unless they agree to some so-called so tax increases, right? And those tax increases are all designed to blow up on the middle class. So they're going to put every kind of pressure they can on the White House and at now on the House Republicans to make sure they get that grand bargain where they get giant tax cuts for corporations on Wall Street. That's how the real world works. That's why we got downgraded. Although, as I explained to you before, that is, has nothing to do with why Wall Street uh, uh, stock market is ironically crumbling now. It's because their greed ran amok. And now they realize, oh my god, we took all the money for the rich, and now the middle class have no money to buy anything. All right, that is your quick, kind of quick and dirty explanation of what went down over the weekend. We got a lot more news. Come right back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Jen and Anna with you. I just hey. found. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Anna turns out agrees with us on the Michelle Bachman cover. I do. Yeah, that's. Uh, they did it wrong, man. They did it wrong. And it's completely different from the Sarah Palin cover from 2009. Because remember, conservatives were upset at the Sarah Palin cover because she had a little peach fuzz and they didn't Photoshop it in the cover. Right. But what are you going to do? Like, okay, if you don't want peach fuzz in your high resolution pictures, then wax it. Right. Like, it's not like they purposely did that to make her look bad. But right. in this case, I think they purposely used a photo that would like make Michelle Bachman look bad and get a little publicity while doing it. Yeah. I mean, imagine if they did that to you. No, live it. <laughs> right? Live I mean, you'd be out of it. Like, here, Hayes was coming to me. They put a picture of you being like... Because <laughs> you know they take a million pictures, right? A million. They're k candidates for president, right? Right. So they can use any picture they like. And when they use a picture, you're like, oh, come on, dude. Not only that, think about all the videos we're in, and each still frame is more comical than the next. Like, I'll see the guys editing sometimes, and then the still frame will be like me cross eyed with like my mouth open. And I'm like, wait a minute, how there did was. that even <laughs> there, There's no question there was a still frame in there where she was mouth open. <laughs> All right, anyway, so uh, we've already declared them guilty, so let's move forward. All right, I want to start off with an update on a story that we did last month regarding Ohio State Senator Chris Jordan. If you guys can remember, her, his wife had called 911 uh, for a domestic uh, situation. They were apparently fighting, and uh, by listening to the 911 calls, it sounded like his wife was extremely scared. She had mentioned that he had a gun, and she was afraid for her life. It was a very scary and chilling audio recording, right? Um, well, now it turns out that uh, the prosecutor in the state will not uh, file charges against uh, the state senator because his wife says that she will not testify in, the, in any case against him. This happens so often, where the victims of domestic violence uh, then uh, run back into the arms of the perpetrator, and they say, oh, no, he didn't do anything wrong. Now, what I found interesting in this story was his excuses to the police on that night, which apparently were recorded on their, uh, the video cameras on their cars, right, right as they're talking outside. Uh, and he says, oh, you know, she's just trying to cost me, you know, my position in the state senate. 
Uh, we actually have his exact quote, okay? okay? So I want to read that to you. He says, she got a little upset. Girls do that. Oh. I threw some things on the ground, but I didn't hit her or anything. Uh, so she's all worked up about who knows. Yeah, it's, it's her fault. You know, you know how girls are. Okay, how much First of all, it? he's married to a woman. Referring to her as a girl is so degrading. But I mean, look, I feel bad because his wife is in a horrible situation. You know, it, it's a huge accusation to say that someone is abusing their wife. But in this case, listening to those recordings and hearing her say he has a gun makes me think he's abusing his wife. Okay? Look, we, we showed it, those recordings uh, for almost like 20 minutes on an earlier show where she's in an absolute state of panic. And she says he's done this many times before, but this time he's got a gun, I'm worried. And whenever he comes in the room, she starts talking in coded language, he leaves the room, she's like, come now. I mean, she's scared for her life, right? Right. And then this guy says, oh, you know how girls are. And then the second part of the quote. Um, he says that he threw towels on the ground, right? right? Oh, this was all over towels, that so you threw towels on the ground, right? It wasn't the 10 or 15 guns that they had in the house. Right. That's what she told uh, operators, 911 operators, when she called it. And when she told the operator that he had a gun, she sounded genuinely concerned that it was a loaded gun. But when police arrived to the scene, she kind of changed her story and said, yeah, we have 14 or 15 guns in the house, they're unloaded. I, I don't want to testify against him, let's just drop it. So that's what ended up happening. They dropped it and now he doesn't face any charges, which makes me worried for her. Because in a lot of cases when women are abused in their marriages, they get scared and, and they get sucked right back into it and they it, it's a vicious cycle, it happens over and over again. Yeah, and by the way, on the tapes, again, we heard it for ourselves and we shared it with you on an earlier show. Uh, she says, be careful because he's holding the gun. Later in the tapes, he puts down the gun. She explains it all to the 911 operator. So it, she said he's got it in his pants, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it wasn't like some unloaded gun locked away in a safe. So, uh, no, the when I heard uh, his excuses to the cops, that's what made me more angry. When he's like, oh, I'm just throwing some towels, and you know how these girls are. And I was like, oh man, I'm so pissed. It's because she, she is gonna continue to be in trouble, and she had her opportunity here to get out of the situation, she didn't, and God knows what happens next. Another thing he told the cops was that her reaction was just 90% emotion. Like she was overreacting, it's 90% emotion. Well, Nothing gets under my skin more than the emotion excuse. Like, well, don't listen to her, she's just emotional. Don't listen to her, it's that time of the month. Well, you know how girls are. Yeah. yeah, there was that one part when he was basically telling the police, he goes, well, you know, I'm a state senator, at least until she gets me kicked out of office with all this madness that she keeps getting me involved in. So, I mean, it's another indication. It shows that no matter what happens, the situation is whatever started the argument, it's her fault. So, I mean, you know, it's all speculation, of course. But it sounds like afterwards, he's like, you see what kind of trouble he almost got me into? And it turns into another, it, it, it looks like another cycle. He's like, look what happened to me because of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's going to go right back into it. Yeah, because you didn't take your abuse properly. So, you know, it's all your fault. No, I, it's, you're right. You, I'd be shocked if he didn't blame her for it. I'd be shocked if she didn't accept that blame. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Because that's the pattern that you see. Uh, he's a Republican. I wonder if she's a Democrat. I don't mean to make light of it. She, we wish her well. The American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as ALEC, is snatching up public employees' jobs, and they're also hurting small businesses. And ha the, the way that they're doing that is they are transferring jobs over to prison laborers. Oh, fantastic, because, you know, we weren't close enough to slave labor. Let's just get right to it, right? This is, this is literally modern version of slave labor. What they're doing is they are having uh, prisoners, okay, do the work that public employees are doing now, except prisoners do it for free or they do it for like 20 cents an hour. Yeah, let's be fair now. 20 cents an hour. I mean, isn't that a livable wage? Yeah, they're in prison anyway. What difference does it make? We, they have to do it. We can force them to do it. What, who else did we used to force to do labor? Hmm, let me try to remember, okay? And they say, but hey, out of the goodness of our heart, we're providing shelter for them in prison. And that's part of their compensation. No, but you know what they're saying? They're saying, oh, well, you know, these people are in prison. Tax dollars are helping to fund them, so they're in prison. It Doesn't it make sense to make them work and pay off their debt? Like, that's the way that they try to sell it. But it's a vicious cycle. Let me explain to you how they do this. So what ALEC does is it works with state legislators to pass extremely 
tough on crime legislation, okay? So uh, they are in favor of the drug war. They worked with state legislators in Arizona to pass SB 1070. And what they want to do is they want to have more and more people imprisoned, right? So these private prisons make a huge profit off of that. Now, what happens after that? Since so many people are in jail, states accumulate huge deficits, right? Mm -hmm. So since they have these deficits, what do they need to do? They need to find a way to pay for it. And a good way to save money is to stop paying public employees and have these prisoners do the same jobs for free or essentially no money at all, like 20 cents to a dollar an hour. So this is not speculation. You can actually trace the legislation. It comes from this business lobby and it goes straight to the Republican lawmakers, and it becomes acts. It's traced in a series of articles in the nation in these times, uh, and the list goes on and on. It's very well documented. Uh, two of the biggest groups in this group, in, in ALEC, are Corrections Corporation of America and the GEO Group. They're formerly known as Wackenhut uh, Corrections. They're the two largest uh, private uh, prison companies in the country. And what they do is they do things like the Prison Industries Act, and they have the Republicans pass it. So what it does is it creates more and more prisons for these private pr prisoners for these private prisons. For example, uh, they wrote SB 1070 in Arizona, the one that uh, would make it illegal not to have your papers with you. Right. You know, it, the, the f famous case in Arizona where they're going to ask everybody for their papers. And, of course, these two corporations will benefit greatly from it, from it because you'll have much more prisoners. And they're the ones who wrote it. So now this is a great uh, crime, basically, in, in our system because our system has been so corrupted that these private companies simply buy the politicians, they get them to pass any laws that they like, they create more prisoners, and then they turn around, profit off the prisoners, and then make them do nearly slave labor and profit off of that as well. Just to give you some more information on this, right now in Arizona, what they're trying to do is build more um, fences along the border, right? And one way that they're doing that is they're having prisoners do it for free. Right. Now, now, just think about that for a second, okay? Legislators in Arizona passed SB 1070, so Mexicans get imprisoned, and then those same Mexicans are used to build fences for the borders for virtually no money. Well, it's, you know, it's brilliant in its uh, depravity. And, you know, it, it, by the way, on drug laws, of course, these companies and ALEC is pushing for tougher and tougher drug laws. Why? They need more prisoners for their private prisons and they're for their uh, companies that continue to make money. By the way, one of the things that gets hurt, small businesses. Absolutely. Like some print shops, for example, that are now the prisoner, the prison companies are competing with are getting run out of business in states like Florida uh, because they're small business. They can't keep up with this large business, which has bought the government and allowed them to have an advantage where their workers get paid 20 cents an hour. How in the world could you compete with that? We're worried about competing with China? Are you kidding me? I you know. can't compete with the prison companies. That, and that's another thing that I found fascinating. Alex's response to all of this is what? At least we're not outsourcing jobs. <laughs> yeah, well, they're literally insourcing them. They put them inside prisons where they can't move at all and make them work for them. No, I mean, this is capitalism gone wrong. This is the worst parts of capitalism on steroids. Look, this can be prevented. It doesn't mean capitalism is wrong. The main thing you have to prevent is corporations buying politicians. If you let them purchase politicians, of course they will rig all the rules completely in their favor, including getting nearly free labor and destroying all other businesses. See, it doesn't help capitalism. Corporatism, once it, corporations are born, their job is to kill their parents, which is capitalism, because they hate free markets. They don't want competition. They want to destroy the competition. So the minute they're hatched, if you allow them to buy politicians, they use the politicians to kill off all their competitors, especially small businesses. And then we wonder, why do we have high unemployment? One, you killed the small businesses, and two, you're hiring prisoners at 20 cents an hour. Why would anybody else hire uh, regular Americans at real wages? Exactly. No, no, look, the more you look into this group, Alec, the more you see that it is at the heart of the beast. Okay. Well, they're work I mean, they're working with the Koch brothers. Alec, the Koch brothers, they, they essentially have the exact same goals, and that's to get rid of unions, get rid of public employees. You know, they claim that they're in, they believe in the free market, but if you believe in the free market, then you wouldn't be doing this to small businesses. Small businesses are getting hurt through, because of this prison labor. So are you really free market? Hell no, you're not free market. It's, you're just, it's all about corporations. No, no. 
soon, I'm telling you, man, really, really soon, it's coming. Uh, we're we're going to come for these guys, okay? They, they've been coming for us all this time. Well, we got to turn this thing around, man. We got to fight the corporate machines because these corporate machines are killing our democracy and actually they're also killing our capitalist system and our free markets. Okay. 26-year-old Raymond Johnson from South Carolina got diagnosed with breast cancer. Even though he's a male, there are about uh, 2,000 men each year that get diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, the only problem is his, in, uh, his employer does not provide health insurance for him, so he turned to Medicaid. But mm -hmm. he got a shocking answer when he uh, looked for that kind of health coverage. So let's watch the video. It explains a little more. Think of breast cancer, you probably think of women, but men get it too. Roughly 1 in 100 or 2,100 cases per year. And as we learned tonight, they can't always count on the same financial assistance. Raymond Johnson is getting what most men don't. If we can get them to add baseline LFTs, that would be great. A breast exam. Yeah, see that? You got it? Okay. To be 26 and have breast cancer is really, really a surprise. He found a lump about a month ago, but thought it was just a cyst until a pain in his chest sent him to the ER. Next, a biopsy and a phone call his mother will never forget. It was cancer. And all I could do was cry. Because I'm thinking, wow. I only have two children, and one of them has cancer. And all I could do was cry. And that's not all. Raymond doesn't have insurance. That's where Susan Applebaum comes in. He's young, he's working, and um, he's worried um, this could be financially devastating to him. She searched for resources and came across a state program that provides Medicaid for breast cancer patients. She applied, but Raymond was denied. Why? Take a look, because he is a guy. Right now I'm just stuck with these bills and trying to find a way. But time is running out. Raymond is on his second round of chemotherapy. This is a blue chemo pad so that none of the chemotherapy drips on your clothes. The treatment so toxic, the woman giving it has to wear special clothes. Each treatment is probably roughly around 10 grand. Expensive, but needed to save Raymond's life and would be paid for if he wasn't a man. I, I can't understand things, man. So, so since you're a male, you don't get treatment. You don't get covered because men don't usually get breast cancer. That doesn't make any sense. That's, by the way, Medicaid is funded by the federal government. This is discrimination. Yeah. Can, can you imagine <laughs> if they did it in reverse and they said, well, women don't normally get whatever kind of cancer. And they're like, well, since you don't normally get it, we're not covering it, even if you do get it. But who cares of what you normally get or don't get if you actually got it? I mean, Medicaid is supposed to be health insurance for the poor. If they can't afford it and they've got a condition, that's what it's supposed to cover. Uh, well, well, on the other hand, your condition is really rare. And? But this is a problem that we have with like private health insurance companies, right? And now we have something that's funded by the federal government that's just as stupid. Yeah, well, congratulations to us. Uh, by the way, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit uh, at the end of last week, but I've been reading more and more about it. That, uh, those spending cuts, like you think just a trillion dollars in spending cuts that they've already agreed to and another one and a half trillion coming, you think they just, they don't affect anything, that they're just out of nowhere? No. They're, once you start finding out what they affect, you're going to be outraged. That's why the Democrats haven't told you so far, because they already agreed to it. And obviously the Republicans don't want you to know, right? And one of the things that it affects is Medicaid. Of course, of course. So, so pretty soon, if you're a female with breast cancer, you won't get covered. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Well, look, the thing is, but it's not just that it's Medicaid and it's going to hurt the poor the most, et cetera. Like, okay, we all get that. You know, we, we knew that's what was coming, right? But what it also does is it really hurts President Obama's health care plan. Because the whole idea was we increase the number of people uh, on Medicaid by moving up the income ladder. Like, so instead of people, I'm making up numbers now, that get, make less than $20,000 being covered by Medicaid, it would go all the way up to $80,000. So that, hey, listen, if you don't have insurance through your employer or whatever it is, don't worry, at least you're going to get Medicaid. That's why 30 million new people are going to be covered. 
except we just cut those programs. So maybe they won't be covered. And But don't worry, you still get the mandate. JR and I talked about this, I think a little more off air than we did on air at the end of last week. So funny how the Republicans, in all this cutting, et cetera, just happen to leave the mandate in place. I know. The thing that they originally proposed, then pretended to be outraged by, and said was unconstitutional. But look at this. It turns out less people are going to be covered, but the mandate's still there. Funny how that worked out. Hmm. It's so oh. freaking depressing. Okay, yes. I agreed. Let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, le lesson of the story, if you're a man, don't make the mistake of getting breast cancer. If you're a poor man, especially. Yeah. <laughs>